Hudson Taylor, in the early years. The Growth of the Soul, Chapter 10. From Faith to Faith. January through March, 1852. I never made a sacrifice, said Hudson Taylor in later years, looking back over a life in which, to an unusual extent, this element predominated. But what he said was true. For as in the case in point, the first great sacrifice he was privileged to make for China, the compensations that followed were so real and lasting that he came to see that giving up is inevitably receiving when one is dealing heart to heart with God. It was so, very manifestly, this winter. In the hour of trial, a step of faith had been taken and a victory won that made it possible for the Holy Spirit to lead him on. Not outwardly only, but inwardly, he had accepted the will of God, giving up what seemed his best and highest, the love that had become part of his very life, that he might be unhindered in serving and following Christ. The sacrifice was great, but the reward far greater. Unspeakable joy, he tells us. All day long and every day was my happy experience. God, even my God, was a living, bright reality, and all I had to do was joyful service. A new tone is perceivable about his letters, which are less introspective from this time onward and more full of missionary purpose. China comes to the front again in all his thinking, and there is a quickened longing for likeness to Christ and unbroken fellowship with him. Jesus himself was filling the empty place and drawing his servant on to deeper love and closer following. Quote, I feel my need for more holiness, unquote, he wrote to his sister early in the new year. Quote, and conformity to him who has loved us and washed us in his blood. Love, so amazing, should indeed cause us to give our bodies and spirits to him as living sacrifices. Oh, I wish I were ready. I long to be engaged in the work. Pray for me that I may be made more useful here and fitted for extended usefulness hereafter. Unquote. Again, a few weeks later, I almost wish I had a hundred bodies. They should all be devoted to my Savior in the missionary cause. But this is foolishness. I have almost more than I can do to manage one. It is so self-willed, earthly-minded, fleshly. Constantly I am aggrieving my dear Savior who shed for me his precious blood, forgetting him who never have, has relaxed his watchful care and protection over me from the earliest moment of my existence. I am astonished at the littleness of my gratitude and love to him and compounded by his long-suffering mercy. Pray for me that I will live more and more to his praise, be more devoted to him, incessant in labors in his cause, fitted for China, ripened for glory. But though he was happy and full of blessing, his mother at home was not a little troubled. She had a good idea by this time of his sufferings at Drainside, and read between the lines of his own cheery letters. It distressed her to think of what seemed unnecessary privations, especially when she learned from others that he was looking pale and thin. I am sorry you made yourself anxious about me, he wrote in January. I think it is because I have begun to wear a larger coat that everyone says how poorly and thin you look. However, as you want to know everything, I have had a heavy cold that lasted a week. But since then, I have them as well as ever in my life. I eat like a horse, sleep like a top, and have the spirits of a lark. I do not know that I have any anxiety save to be more holy and useful. I was in the garden street on Sunday. We seemed welcome and were heard with great attention. When there, it would save me ten or fifteen minutes walk if I came home by drainside, footnote, along the little canal in the dark, and foot, and, and a footnote. But I always go round at night, though ever so tired, because you wish it. So I am sure you need not be concerned about me. As to my health, I think. Sometimes I have too much. 
for I have such a flow of spirits, and often have to restrain myself from idle conversation and jokes. In the multitudes of words there wanteth not sin. Praise God, I have much to be thankful for. The lines have fallen upon me in pleasant places. Dr. Hardy talks to me more like a friend than an employer. Of course, I know how to keep my place, and I can truly say I am thankful for the reading habits you implanted in me that make me more or less independent of companions. But the one he sought to comfort was far from satisfying. He was well, apparently, for the moment, and happy in the Lord. But if this were the line he was taking up, what would it mean for the future? Yes, the future. That was the trouble. In the light of pr present provisions, she saw with plainful clearness all that life in China might bring. And he was her only son. Ah, that shrinking of mother's hearts. God only who made us fully understand. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not fathom the depth of even that anguish? Yes, he has bore it too. God himself suffered most for a sinner, sorrowing world, and he does not forget. He knows all it costs to give up home and loved ones and go alone to earth's dark places to lay down life itself. It may be in seeking souls for whom the Savior died. And he knows, too, the sacrifice of those who cannot go but send their dearest, life of their life, soul of their soul. And with bleeding, thankful hearts look up into his face, saying, and saying truly, I have nothing too precious for Jesus. He did not blame this mother, that for a moment she seemed to waver. It is only through the eternal spirit such sacrifices can ever be unreservedly offered. And for the passing hesitation we may well be thankful, seeing it called forth the following that might otherwise have been written. Do not let anything unsettle you, dear mother. Missionary work is indeed the noblest mortals can engage in, and angels would be proud if I may use such an expression if they could be permitted to share so glorious an undertaking. We certainly cannot be insensible to the ties of nature, but should we not rejoice when we have everything we can give up for the Savior? He would be far more unsettled if I were to turn away from this work and if the Lord were to withdraw his restraining grace and I fell into sin in consequence, would you not? It is all of his mercy that I am preserved from many of the pitfalls that ensnare other young men. As to my health, I think I never was so well and hearty in my life. The winds here are extremely searching, but as I always wrap up well, I am pretty secure. The cold weather gives me a good appetite, and it would be dear economics to stint myself. So I take as much plain, substantial food as I need, but to waste nothing on luxuries. In going to my lodgings, I have somehow got into one particular route, and always go the same way and cross at the same place. I have never passed the gate once, and at night the reflection of the lamps and windows opposite are always shining on the drain. I have found some brown biscuits that are really as cheap as bread, 18 pence a stone, and much nicer. For breakfast I have biscuits and herring, which is cheaper than butter for a penny, and half a one is enough, with coffee. For dinner, I have at present a prune and apple pie. Prunes are two or three pence a pound, and apples ten pence a pack. I use no sugar but loaf, which I powder, and at four pence half a penny a pound, I find it is cheaper than the coarser kind. Sometimes I have roast potatoes and tongue, which is as inexpensive as any of the meat. For tea, I have biscuits, and apples. I take no supper, or occasionally a little biscuit and apple. Sometimes I have rice pudding, a few peas boiled instead of potatoes, and now and then some fish. But being wide awake, I can get cheese at four pence to six pence a pound. That is better than we often have at home for eight pence. Now I see rhubarb and lettuce in the market, so I shall soon have another change. I pickled a penny red cabbage with three half-pence worth of vinegar, 
which made me a, a large jerful. So you see, at those expense, I enjoyed many comforts. To bees at a home where every want is anticipated, and the peace of God which passes all understanding. And if I were not happy and contented, I should deserve to be miserable. I am engaging on these trifles, though they are not worth writing about, because I know they will interest you, and perhaps help you to feel more settled about me. If not, please tell me, and I will not do so any more. Continue to pray for me, dear mother. Though comfortable as regards temporal matters, and happy and thankful, I feel I need your prayers. Oh, mother, I cannot tell you, I cannot describe how I long to be a missionary, to carry the glad tidings to poor, perishing sinners, to spread and be spent for him who died for me. I feel as if for this I could give up everything, every idol, however dear. Think, mother, of twelve million, a number so great that it is impossible to realize it. Yes, twelve million souls in China every year passing without God and without hope into eternity. Oh, what need for earnestness in the church and in individual believers. Do we not deserve, by our worldly mindedness, our indolence and our apathy, our ingratitude and disobedience to the divine command, go teach all nations? Do we not deserve to experience little of the love of God and the peace of Christianity? Oh, it is a noble and honorable calling. I feel my utter unworthiness and unfitness for it. I want more of the divine life, more of the Spirit of God, to make me a faithful witness and servant. Oh, for more grace, love, zeal, faith, holiness. Please tell Father that I have been going to write to him several times a week to say, if he would only go to China and preach the gospel, I would work like a slave and live cheap and send him 25 or 30 pounds a year myself until he gets established. Or if he prefers, I will give up my situation and come home and manage the business for him for five or six years. Tell him the voyage would probably lengthen his life. He has a gift for languages. The Reverend William Burns preached his first sermon in China only six months after landing. Does he not think there are plenty of Christians in Barnsley? But who cares for China? They are dying, dying, dying. 250,000 every week without the knowledge of God, of Christ, of salvation. Let us look with compassion on this multitude. God has been merciful to us. Let us be like him. The cry comes. Help us. Help us. Will a man care for our souls? Can we refuse? Shall we whose souls are lighted with wisdom from on high, shall we to men be knighted the lamp of light deny? I must conclude. Would you not give up all for Jesus who died for you? Yes, Mother, I know you would. God be with you and comfort you. Must I leave as soon as I can save money enough to go? I feel as if I could not live if something is not done for China. What a glimpse is here afforded into his deeper life during the, that winter at Drainside. I cannot tell you, I cannot describe how I long to be a missionary, to carry the glad tidings to poor perishing sinners. For this, I could give up everything, every idol, however dear. I feel as if I could not live if something is not done for China. This was no mere emotion no superficial interests that might give place to considerations of personal advantage. It was not that he had taken up missionary work as a continual branch of Christian activity, but that the need of the perishing in heathen lands, the need and longing of the heart of Christ, them also I must bring, had gripped him and held him fast. He believed that the heathen are perishing and that without a knowledge of the one and the only Savior, they must be eternally lost. He believed that it was in view of this, and because of his infinite love that God had given, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And these convictions plagued him to the only life possible in view of such stupendous facts, a life wholly given to making that great redemption known, especially to those who had never heard Yet, much as he longed to go and go at once, 
there were considerations that held him back. To me, it was a grave, very grave matter, he wrote of that winter, to contemplate going out to China, far from all human aid, there to depend upon the living God alone for protection, supplies, and help of every kind. I felt that one's spiritual muscles required strengthening for such an undertaking. There was no doubt that if faith did not fail, God would not fail. But what if one's faith should prove insufficient? I had not at that time learned that even if we believe not, yet he abided faithful. He cannot deny himself. It was consequently a very serious question to my mind, not whether he was faithful, but whether I had strong enough faith to warrant my embarking in the enterprise set before me. When I get out to China, I thought to myself, I shall have no claim on anyone for anything. My only claim will be on God. How important to learn before leaving England, to move man through God by prayer alone. He knew that faith was the only power, the one power, that could remove mountains, conquer every difficulty, and accomplish the impossible. But, but had he the right kind of faith? Could he stand alone in China? Much as he longed to be a missionary, would such faith as he possessed be sufficient to carry him through all that must be faced? What had it carried him through already, here at home? He thankfully realized that the faith, the faith he longed for, was a gift of God, and that it might grow exceedingly. But for growth, exercise was needed, and exercise of faith was obviously impossible apart from trial. Then, welcome trial, welcome anything that would increase and strengthen this precious gift, proving to his own heart, at any rate, that he had faith of this sort that would really stand and grow. And here it should be remembered that in taking this attitude before the Lord, Hudson Taylor was wholly earnest and sincere. He was bringing all the ties into the storehouse, a most important consideration, leading a life that made it possible for him to exercise faith, to which God could respond in blessing. In a word, there was no hindrance in himself to the answer to his prayers. And experiences followed that have been made an encouragement to thousands the world, wide world over. The story, though well known, will bear repeating here, illustrating as it does the only principle of growth in spiritual things, from faith to faith. The law reiterated by our Lord himself, He that hath, to him shall be given. To learn before leaving England, to move man through God by prayer alone, this, and nothing less, was the object Hudson Taylor had before him now, and it was not long before he came to see a, a simple, natural way of practicing this lesson. At home, my kind employer, always busy, wished me to remind him whenever my salary was due. This I determined not to do directly, but to ask that God would bring the fact to his recollection, and thus encourage me by answering prayer. At one time, as the day drew near, for the payment of a quarter's salary. I was, as usual, much in prayer about it. The time arrived, but Dr. Hardly made no allusion to the matter. I continued praying. Days passed on, and he did not remember, until at length, and settling up my weekly accounts one Saturday night, I found my, myself possessed of only one remaining coin, a half-crown piece. Still, I had hitherto known no lack, and I continued praying. That Sunday was a, a very happy one. As usual, my heart was full and brimming over with blessing. After attending divine service in the morning, my afternoons and evenings were taken up with gospel work in the various lodging houses I was accustomed to visit in the lowest part of town. At such times, it almost seemed to me as if heaven were begun below, and that all that could be looked for was an enlargement of one's capacity for joy not a truer feeling than I possessed. After concluding my last service about 10 o'clock that night, a poor man, asking me to go and pray with his wife, saying that she was dying, I readily agreed, and on the way to his house asked him why he had not sent for the priest, as his accent told me he was an Irishman. He had done so, he said, but the priest refused to come without a payment of 18 pence, which the man did not possess, as the family was starving. 
it immediately. It occurred to my mind that all the money I had in the world was a solitaire half-crown, and that it was in one coin. Moreover, that while the basin of water cool I usually took for supper was awaiting me, and there was sufficient in the house for breakfast in the morning, I certainly had nothing for dinner on the coming day. Somehow or other, there was at once a stoppage and a flow of joy in my heart. But instead of reproving myself, I began to reprove the poor man, telling him that it was a very wrong to have allotted matters to get into such a state as he described, and that he ought to have applied to the relieving officer. His answer was that he had done so, and was told to come at eleven o'clock the next morning, but that he feared his wife might not live through the night. Ah, thought I, if only I had two shillings and a sixpence, instead of this half-crown, how gladly would I give these poor people a shilling. But to part with the half-crown was far from my thoughts. I little dreamed that the truth of the matter simply was that I could trust God plus one and sixpence, but was not prepared to trust Him only, without any money at all in my pocket. My conductor led me into a court, down which I followed him with some degree of nervousness. I had found myself there before, and at my last visit had been roughly handled. My tracks had been torn to pieces in such a warning, giving me now to come again that I felt more than a little concern. Still, it was the path of duty, and I followed on. Up a miserable flight of stairs into a wretched room, he led me, and, oh, what a sight there presented itself. Four or five children stood about, the sunken cheeks and temples, all telling them unmistakably the story of slow starvation, and lying on a wretched pallet was a poor, exhausted mother, with a tiny infant, thirty-six hours old, moaning instead, rather than crying at her side, for it seemed too seen, for it too seemed spent and failing. Ah, thought I, if I had two shillings and a sixpence instead of a half crown, how gladly should I they have one and sixpence of it. But still, a wretched unbelief prevented me from obeying the impulse to relieve their distress at the cost of all I possessed. It will scarcely seem strange that I was unable to say much to comfort these poor people. I needed comfort myself, and I began to tell them, however, that, that they must not be cast down, that though the circumstances were very distressing, there was a kind and loving Father in heaven, but something within me cried, You hypocrite, telling these unconverted people about a kind and loving Father in heaven, and not prepared to yourself to trust him without half a crown. I was nearly choked. How gladly would I have compromised with conscience if I had had a florine and a sixpence. I would have given the florine thankfully and kept the rest. But I was not yet prepared to trust in God alone without the sixpence. To talk was impossible under these circumstances. Yet, strange to say, I felt I, I should have no difficulty in praying. Prayer was a delightful occupation in those days. Time thus spent never seemed wearisome, and I knew no lack of words. I seemed to think that all I should have to do would be to kneel down and pray, and that relief would come to them and to myself together. You asked me to come and pray with your wife, I said to the man. Let us pray, and I knelt down. But no sooner had I opened my lips with, Our Father who art in heaven, then conscious said within me, Dare you mock God? Dare you kneel down and call him Father with that half crown in your pocket? Such a time of conflict then came upon me as I have never experienced before or since. How I got through that form of prayer I know not, and whether the words uttered were connected or disconnected I cannot tell. But I arose from my knees in great distress of mind. The poor father turned to me and said, you see what a terrible state we are in, sir? If you can help us, for God's sake, do. At that moment, the word flashed into my mind. Give to him that asketh of thee. And in the word of a king, there is power. I put my hand in my pocket and slowly drawing out the half crown, gave it to the man, telling him that it might seem a small matter for me to relieve them, seeing that I was comparatively well off, but that in parting with that coin, I was giving him my all. What I had been trying to tell them was indeed true. God really was a father and might be trusted. The joy all came back in full flooding flood tide to my heart. I could say anything and feel it then, and the hindrance to blessing was gone. Gone, I trust, forever. Not only was the poor woman's life saved, but my life, as I fully realized, had been saved too. 
It might have been a wreck, would have been, probably, as a Christian life, had not grace at that time conquered and the striving of God's Spirit been obeyed. I well remembered how then that night, as I went home to my lodgings, my heart was as light as my pocket. The dark deserted streets resounded with a hymn of praise that I could not restrain. When I took my basin of cruel before retiring, I could not have exchanged it for a prince's feast. I reminded the Lord as I knelt at my bedside of his own words, He that giveth to the poor, let us to the Lord. I asked him not to let my loan be a long one, or I should have no dinner next day. And with peace within and peace without, I spent a happy, restful night. Next morning, for breakfast, my plate of porridge remained, and before it was finished, the postman knocks was heard at the door. I was not in the habit of receiving letters on Mondays. My parents and most of my friends refrained from posting on Saturday, so that it was su somewhat surprised when the landlady came in holding a letter or a packet in her wet hand covered by her apron. I looked at the letter, but could not make out the writing. It was either a strange hand or a fenced one, and the postmark was blurred. Where it came from, I could not tell. On opening the envelope, I found nothing within it. But inside a sheet of blank paper was was folded, a pair of kid gloves, from which, as I opened them in astonishment, half a sovereign fell to the ground. Praise the Lord, I examined, 400% for 12 hours investment. That is good interest. How glad the merchants of hell would have been, would be if they could lend their money at such a rate. Then and there I determined that a bank that could not break should have my savings or earnings, as the case may be, a determination I have not yet learned to regret. I cannot tell you how often my mind has reoccurred to this incident or all the help it has been to me in circumstances of difficulty in afterlife. If we are faithful to God in little things, we shall gain experience and strength that will be helpful to us in the more serious trials of life. But this was not the end of the story, nor was it the only answer to prayer that was to confirm his faith at this time. For the chief difficulties still remain. Dr. Hardy had not remembered, and though prayer was unremitting, other matters appeared entirely to engross his attention. It would have been so easy to remind him, but what then of the lesson upon the acquirement of which Hudson Taylor felt his future usefulness depended to move man through God by prayer alone. This remarkable and gracious deliverance, he continued, was a great joy to me as well as a strong confirmation of faith. But of course, ten shillings, however economically used, will not go very far, and it was nonetheless necessary to continue in prayer, asking that the larger supply, which was still due, might be remembered and paid. All my petitions, however, appeared to remain unanswered, and before a fortnight elapsed, I found myself pretty much in the same position that I had occupied on the Sunday night, already made so memorable. Meanwhile, I continued pleading with God more and more earnestly that he would himself remind Dr. Hardy that my salary was due. Of course, it was not the one of money that distressed me. That could have been had at any time for the asking. But the question at most of my mind was this, can I go to China? Or will my want of faith and power with God prove so serious an obstacle as to preclude my entering upon this much prized service? As the week drew to a close, I felt exceedingly embarrassed. There was not only myself to consider. On Saturday night, a payment could be due to my Christian landlady, which I knew she could not well dispense with. Ought I not for her sake to speak about the matter of salary? Yet to do so would be to myself at any rate, the admission that I was not fixed to undertake a missionary enterprise. I gave nearly the whole of Thursday and Friday all the time, not occupied in my necessary employment to earnest wrestling with God in prayer. But still on Saturday morning, I was in the same position as before, and now my earnest cry was for guidance as to whether I should still continue to wait the Lord's time. As far as I could judge, I received the assurance that to wait his time is best and that God in some way or other would in interpose on my behalf. So I waited. My heart being now at rest and the burden gone. About five o'clock that afternoon, when, when Dr. Hardy had finished writing his prescriptions, his last circuit for the day being taken, he threw himself back in his armchair as he was wont and began to speak of the things of God. He was a truly Christian man, and many seasons of happy fellowship we had together. 
I was busily watching at the time a pan in which a decoction was boiling that required a good deal of attention. It was indeed fortunate for me that it was so, for without any obvious connection with what had been going on, all at once he said, By the way, Taylor, is not your salary due again? My emotions may be imagined. I had to swallow two or three times before I could answer. With my eye fixed on the pan, my back to the doctor, I told him as quietly as I could that I was overdue some little time. How thankful I felt at that moment. God surely had heard my prayer and caused him in this way of my great need to remember the sour without any word or suggestion from me. He said, Oh, I am so sorry you did not remind me. You know how busy I am. I wish I had thought of it a little sooner, for only this afternoon I sent all the money I had to the bank. Otherwise, I would pay you at once. It is impossible to describe the revulsion of feeling caused by this unexpected statement. I knew not what to do. Fortunately for me, the pan boiled up, and I had a good reason for rushing with it from the room. Glad indeed I was to get away and keep out of sight until after Dr. Hardy had returned to his house, and most thankful that he had not perceived my emotion. As soon as he was gone, I had to seek my little sanctum and pour out my heart before the Lord for some time before calmness and more than calmness, thankfulness and joy was restored. I felt that God had his own way and was not going to fail me. I had sought to know his will early in the day and as far as I could judge had received guidance to wait patiently. And now God was going to work for me in some other way. That evening was spent as my Saturday evenings usually were and reading the word and preparing the subject on which I expected to speak in the various lodging housings on the morrow. I waited perhaps a little longer than usual. At last, about ten o'clock, there being no interruption of any kind, I put on my overcoat and was preparing to leave for home, rather thankful to know that by that time I should have to let myself in with the latchkey as my landlady retired early. There was certainly no help for that night, but perhaps God would interpose for me by Monday and I might be able to pay my landlady early in the week the money I would have given her before, had it been possible. Just as I was about to turn down the gas, I heard the doctor's steps in the garden that lay between the dwelling house and surgery. He was laughing to himself very heartily, as though greatly amused. Entering the surgery, he asked for the ledger and told me that, strange to say, one of his richest patients had just come to pay his doctor bill. Was it not an odd thing to do? It never struck me that it might have any bearing on my own case, or I might have felt embarrassed. But looking at it simply from the position of an uninterested spectator, I was also, I also was highly amused that a man rolling in wealth should come after 10 o'clock at night to pay a bill, which he could any day have met by a check with the greatest of ease. It appeared that somehow or other he could not rest with this on his mind and had been constrained to come at the unusual hour to discharge his liability. The account was duly received in the ledger, and Dr. Hardy was about to leave, when suddenly he turned and handed me some of the banknotes just received, said to my surprise and thankfulness, By the way, Taylor, you might as well take these notes. I have no change, but can give you the balance next week. Again, I was left, my feelings undiscovered, to go back to my little closet and praise the Lord with a joyful heart, that after all I might go to China. To me this incident was not a trivial one, and to recall it sometimes in circumstances of great difficulty in China or elsewhere has proved no small comfort and strength.